Today we find out what in the world went wrong with the world's most powerful smartphone. I was just minding my own business, bending it in half, when it actually bent in half. To be fair, most phones I try to bend do not break. This ROG 6 Pro is an anomaly, and today we investigate to find out why. Speaking of investigations, huge thanks to KiwiCo for sponsoring this video. My whole life I've been taking things apart and sometimes putting them back together again. Sometimes constructive and sometimes destructive. I do know though that little Jerry would have been enthralled with KiwiCo growing up. KiwiCo has been around for the last 11 years, helping inspire kids to see themselves as makers and exposing kids to concepts in STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math all through super fun monthly hands-on projects, designed by experts and the same things you've seen me build on my channel throughout the year. With the holidays coming up, if you want to surprise a child or teenager in your life with these creative monthly crates, I'll leave a link down in the description for 50% off your first month and free shipping within the United States. KiwiCo.com slash JerryRig. Everything you need comes in these boxes. There are a lot to choose from and most of them are under 20 bucks. KiwiCo puts the fun in fundamentals of the universe. If you want to try them out and support the channel, link is down in the description, kiwico.com slash jerryrig. Now I think it's time we get back to our autopsy. Let's get started. In front of us we have the durability tested ROG Phone 6 Pro with the predecessor from last year, the ROG Phone 5 Ultimate, both of which failed my durability test catastrophically. Come on, Asus. Getting inside the ROG 6 Pro should be a bit easier than usual, since now we don't have to worry about cracking the back glass. I can't imagine it getting any worse than it is right now. Cracks can only get so small. The whole thing is just an intricate spider web of finger splinting chaos. There is some adhesive holding a laminated glass to the phone. Nothing super strong. The ROG 6 Pro is only IPX4, so definitely not watertight. Here we get our first glimpse of the 2-inch rear display ribbon cable, as well as the two gold contacts for the NFC pad, which is also glued to the back glass. No wireless charging on this one. There is, however, a strange white sticker, which gives us a direct pathway to the back side of the glass. Kind of interesting. We'll look into this more in a second. We also have the only undamaged portion back here, which is the camera lenses. Moving over to the phone, we can see it's divided into five internal sections, the middle of which is the motherboard, and also right where our unit snapped in half, at the USB-C accessory port and the power button, both placed right in the middle of the frame. There is an extremely strange pass-through chamber, a hole that goes directly from the back glass all the way through the phone to the vapor chamber behind the screen. However, I don't think this cavity's existence would cause any structural issues by itself, I think the biggest culprit is still the USB-C and power button holes, since they both remove structure from the frame at a critical point. But it'll still be interesting to explore this hole more thoroughly. The ROG Phone 5 Ultimate does not seem to have one. I'll remove four screws surrounding the motherboard, so we can take off the metal plate. Then I'll pop off some of the upper extension ribbons just like a little Lego. Also, I didn't know this yet, but there are additional ribbon cables attached to the underside of the motherboard that are screwed in under metal brackets. Apparently, if you do this for real and actually care about the phone functioning afterward, you should remove the upper and lower section of the phone hardware on either side of the battery to flip the motherboard over and get access to those screws before yoinking the ribbons. Or, you know, if it's already broke, yoink away. With the motherboard out, we see it's dual stacked, just like on the iPhones. We also get our first look at the 3,300 milligrams of vibrantly blue thermal paste that ASUS is calling boron nitride, an aerospace grade thermal compound. Kinda cool. It was probably doing a really good job before the accident. I'll remove six more Phillips head screws along the bottom section of the phone, along with popping out the blue SIM card tray. Kinda cool to see this blue theme going on. Thumbs up for that. The bottom plastic also contains the x-axis vibrator motor, and with that plastic gun, the rat's nest of wire starts to come loose, but it's still stuck under the lower loudspeaker. After another screw is removed, the lower loudspeaker is free from the phone, and while it does have the waterproofing mesh over the opening, it does not have any internal foam balls. 
There's one more screw holding down the lower USB-C port. And after that's gone, our complex conglomerate of ribbons is free from the phone. Reminds me of the old HTC days. May they RIP. HTC phones were some of the most difficult to take apart because of the ribbons. Nobody should ever go full HTC. There's no rubber ring around the USB-C port. I also think there are too many letters in this video. The battery setup inside the ROG, see what I mean, is pretty interesting. We already knew there were two of them, but two batteries in a phone is pretty normal these days. iPhones have two cells, OnePlus phones have two, and electric vehicles have thousands. But this time the cells are detached, spaced out and connected with a permanent ribbon, so one battery cannot be removed without the other. This means the four screws at the top plastics need to come out next. The top plastics do contain the upper loudspeaker, which this time around does have the foam balls inside. There are two more screws over on the left by the larger camera. But before those come out though, let's get rid of the batteries. The batteries are very strongly stuck in place with adhesive. There are no magical pull tabs. But unlike Samsung, these are still within pryable territory, ideally with a plastic pry tool. The split cells give us a typical capacity of 3000 milliamp hours each for a total of 6000. Pretty cool that I can charge at 65 watts with the only slight downside of it also snapping in half. But like with any video game, you win some and you lose some. It's always fun to see things up close and personal from the inside though. Moving back up to the top to remove the cameras, we have the itty bitty 5 megapixel macro camera, which does not have OIS. The other two are mounted together inside the same housing. We have the main 50 megapixel camera on the left and the 13 megapixel ultra wide camera on the right both of which have smaller footprints than we would normally see in a flagship, and surprisingly, neither of them have any optical image stabilization. We haven't had a phone without OIS in years, and especially not on a flagship that costs 1300 bucks. I'm almost more disappointed by the lack of OIS than I am it snapping in half. Let's go deeper. It looks like the copper vapor chamber is pretty massive. And just like on OnePlus, Asus has sandwiched their chamber between the frame and the screen. Lucky for us though, our screen is already mostly removed. Pulling it the rest of the way from the body reveals a few things. First, that the strongest thing on this whole phone is the Victus glass on the front. It remains intact while even the AMOLED panel underneath it is cracked. Nice work, Corning. We can also see the optical fingerprint reader near the bottom of the screen. This lets light through to the fingerprint scanner. There is no lens on the scanner itself, just a sensor. And historically, in my own experience, that type of sensor-only arrangement, without a lens, doesn't tend to scan very well, and might be why it didn't read my finger good. Let's take out that vapor chamber. There's quite a bit of silverish graphite tape below the screen, probably to help spread the heat from the vapor chamber uniformly across the display area, so heat can escape out the front of the phone. without it being concentrated too much in one spot. With the chamber out, we find a white sticker that directly correlates with the cavity we found earlier. I wonder if this cavity is ROG sticking with its historical roots and providing a pathway for heat to escape out through the back glass, even if there aren't any physical vents this time around. The thermoelectric cooler would also not sit over this cavity, so it's a rather interesting arrangement and an interesting placement. Let me know what you think it's for down in the comments. The plastic tunnel walls also do not have any LEDs inside, so it really does just appear to be a conduit from the vapor chamber to the rear of the phone. Speaking of vapor chamber, I seem to have grabbed it in the wrong spot and smurfed my thumb. Sometimes when we open these up, we can see actual liquid inside before it evaporates. Initially, I don't see any moisture, which isn't a big deal. There's such a small amount in here, it could easily evaporate between the time I slice it and the time I peel it back. But with a larger cut lengthwise through the chamber, we do see some really small droplets. Pretty cool. The processor, back when it was alive, would warm up the droplets, which missed away into the far edges of the chamber, only to get wicked back again through the copper mesh as they cooled down to repeat the process. It's like a water cycle in a tiny ecosystem without the ecosystem. Kind of like Earth in 50 years. I mean, it's a pretty cool phone, minus the bending in half part. 
The structural issues, of course, can be remedied with a case and by it being nice to it, but the lack of optical image stabilization, though, makes me kind of sad. Our buddy Boron says hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, come hang out with me on Instagram if you're bored, and thanks a ton for watching. I'll see you around.